Okay, now we are going to talk about the mathematics, the costs and uh, benefits of these acquisitions. And the, well, first of all, we want to know that the A that we have up here is for the acquirer or bidder. I know it's confusing because we have a B, that's not the bidder. A, is, so that's why I call it the acquirer. A is for acquirer. And B is the target. B is the target. Now, remember back when we looked at chapter 8, we talked about only considering the incremental value of incremental cash flows for our projects. And what we're interested here in, the, uh, in our study of mergers and acquisition is the incremental value of the merger. Too often you hear people say stupid stuff like, buying this company will increase our EPS by 30%. Well, if you're just buying the firm and you're not improving the profit, you're not cutting any costs, you're not getting anything new out of it, then basically it's a wash, right? You haven't really accomplished anything. And so what we're looking for here is that when we put these two firms together, there darn well better be some creation of value that happens as a result. So let's talk about, uh, we talked about the merger of the two colleges last time. When you put those two colleges together, there are some cost savings. Now we only have to have one dean. We only have to have one dean's secretary. We only have to have, if we had four associate deans, now we only have to have two. And so there are gains from putting these things together. And that change in value that comes about as a result of putting these things together is called delta V. Delta means change, right? Delta V. Now, if delta V is positive, then that's synergy. If delta V is positive, that's synergy. We don't want to be undertaking any mergers or acquisitions that have a delta V of zero or negative. Okay, so um, if it's uh, greater than zero, we have synergy. Let's talk about how we find delta V. V sub A B is the value of the merged firm. V sub A, B is the value of the merged firm. V sub A is the standalone value of the acquirer or bidding firm. V sub A is the standalone value. Now when I say standalone value, if we're talking about an all equity firm, we're just talking about the number of shares outstanding multiplied by the price per share. Those are the standalone values of the the uh, acquirer and B sub B is the target. Okay, so basically what we're looking at here is, is the merged firm worth more than these two pieces simply just added together? And if it is, then we have delta V greater than zero. Now the next thing we're going to define is VB star. VB star. VB star is the maximum that the bidding firm would be willing to pay for the target. VB star is the maximum that the bidding firm would be willing to pay for the target. VB star, oh for shame, he's late. VB star is the maximum that the bidding firm would be willing to pay for the target. And so we say that the NPV of an acquisition is this VB star that we just talked about minus the cost of firm A to acquire firm B. NPV is just VB star minus the cost to firm A to acquire firm B. In other words, how much are we going to have to pay for it? By the way, um, the standalone value, we're going to have to pay something over and above the standalone value of the target. We're going to have to offer a premium. And here's why. If the target shares are currently selling for $30 a share, anyone that wants to sell their shares at that price has already done so, right? But, so if we want to encourage, entice people to sell their shares, what do we have to offer them? More than 30, right? And that's why there has to be this merger premium. And so this, what they're gonna pay for it is going to be greater than V sub B. Okay, now remember when we talked in chapter seven, we said that NPV rule says except all projects greater than or equal to NPV zero, right? NPV has got to be greater than, oh sorry, not equal to. NPV has got to be greater than zero. And it's exactly the same here. 
You can think of the acquisition as a project, the same that you could think of buying a new machine, or building a new building, or opening a new store. These are all projects, and they should all uh, create positive NPV, because after all, what's the goal of financial management? Maximize, Maximize shareholder wealth, and NPV greater than zero is the only way that we do that. Now, do you think that we have mergers and acquisitions out there that actually destroy value, have NPV less than zero? Absolutely we do. In fact, we see ones with delta V less than zero. And if you've been reading the hubris hypothesis, you start to understand why. Who's making the decisions about these mergers? The bitter. Yeah, the bitter, but we're talking about humans, right? Do you think each one of us really has a really great idea about exactly how rational we are? No. Now, I know that I'm more rational than, say, Mr. Ali, but I, you know, I, that doesn't mean that I am rational enough to know whether or not this whole thing's going to create value. And so that's why we see this start to fall down. And by the way, this hubris that comes into play, what is that? Have you, has anybody here read the paper? What's hubris? It's a type of hypothesis that is made. <laughs> <laughs> hubris is arrogance. It's uh, undeserved self-esteem, right? Have you ever heard anyone say, well, you just think you're so freaking smart, right? Mm -hmm. They're telling you that you're hubristic. Uh, my dissertation advisor used to say, well, he doesn't like for self-esteem, now does he? Right? And he's saying in a big way that this guy thinks he's smarter than he is. Anyway, so that's why we might see bad acquisitions. But being rational scientists as we are, we know that we should only be accepting NPV greater than zero. Okay, now let's see what this does for us. We're going to do an acquisition cost example here. And so we've got the firm, this is pre-merger. I've got Firm A. Firm A has 20 shares outstanding, um, and it has, or has $20 per share price and 25 shares outstanding. Firm B has $10 per share price and 10 shares outstanding. I can find the total market value of both of those because we're assuming that they are both all equity firms. And I will never throw you any problems onto an exam that are anything other than all equity firms. So don't freak out. Don't worry about that. So how do I find the standalone value? It's pretty easy. All I have to do is take the price per share and multiply times the number of shares, and that gives me this total market value. So for firm A, it's 500, and for firm B, it's 100. Now, uh, both firms are 100% equity. I already said that. We estimate delta V to be 100. In other words, delta V, is equal to V sub A, B, plus V, uh, let's see, minus V sub A, minus V sub, oh, plus V sub B. There we go. And so we're saying this thing is 100. And it says it can be broken down, let's see, the board's going to sell, firms B, firm B is the target firm. They're going to sell for 150. Now, firm B, standalone value is 100. And we're going to pay 150 for it. And we just got through saying why we have to do that. We have to offer a premium to entice people to sell their shares. And that extra $50 there has a name. Are you ready? It's called the merger premium. The merger premium is simply the cost to A to acquire B minus the standalone value of B. So the merger premium is just the cost to firm A to acquire firm B minus the standalone value of firm B. So it's over and above what we're paying from the standalone value. That's the merger premium. Okay, so that's why we're saying it's 100 standalone value and a merger premium of 50. So let's go ahead and figure out what is V B star. Well, it's V sub B plus delta V. So V sub B, standalone value of B, is 100, plus we've got this incremental change in value of 100, and that's going to give us a VB star of 200. 
200 is the maximum. In fact, I'm going to tell you that it's actually $199.99, and here's why. If we uh, pay the full 200, then the NPV of this project is going to be zero, right? We don't accept NPV zero projects. In fact, there is gain here. There's still a gain of 100. Who gets the benefit of that gain if we pay the full 100 to the target shareholders? Who gets the benefit of the gain of the benefit? The benefit of the gain? Mr. Mers. The target shareholders. Yeah, the target shareholders get the entire benefit. Now, keep in mind, as a bidding manager, your goal is to maximize the shareholder wealth of your current shareholders. You're not responsible for those target shareholders at all. You're responsible for your own shareholders. As a result, you should be trying to squeeze those target shareholders as tight as you can. So why offer 200 when you could pay 150 for the firm? And this way, you're basically you're, you're giving them 50 of the game, but you're keeping 50 for yourself. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. So when a um, acquirer gets a target firm, do they still want those shareholders? Okay, so we'll get to that. We will get to that. Um, if they pay cash, they're getting rid of them. If they use shares to acquire the other firm, then they're keeping them. And there are implications to both of those. Okay, now there's one thing I'd like to point out here before we move on. We estimate delta V is 100. We have a term for that. What is, what is our term for this estimate that we pull out of the air? Expected value, and what is our slang term for it? Swag. It's a swag, right? Is that delta V of 100 guaranteed? No! In fact, what we're going to see, and by the way, who do you think came up with this estimate of delta V? The bidding managers. And what are they saying? They're saying, oh yeah, that company sucks so bad that just as soon as we take them over and we sprinkle our magic on them, we could easily get 100 in extra value out of it. Do you think that's always true? No. I'll give you an example. Um, the year's 1998. I get sent down to, uh, I, so I'm part of a merger. And the Halliburton people told me, oh yeah, those people suck so bad, you're going to get down there, you're going to find all sorts of things that we can just, you know, save all sorts of money because they're just so dumb. And I got down there and I looked around and it turns out they were actually doing things a little better than we were. And so we had overestimated the gains of the merger because we were suffering from hubris, right? Anytime you walk in somewhere and you assume that these people are all stupid, that they're doing things because they're stupid, be careful. There's always a chance that they know something you don't. And that once you find that out, you may figure out what they're doing makes perfect sense. Okay. So, I think that's all I want to say about this. Let's move on. So, let's talk about, first, if we pay cash for this thing. So firm A is going to pay 150 in cash for firm B. What is the NPV? Well, we said that the NPV is VB star, which we just calculated as being 200, minus the cost of firm A to acquire firm B, which we just told, were told was 150. And so that means the NPV for this project is 50. Should we accept or reject the acquisition? Yeah, we should accept it. And so that's positive, we're going to accept it. And so what's the value of the new firm? Well, the value of the new firm is going to be equal to the standalone value of the target firm, or no, of the bidding firm, sorry, of the acquirer, plus that NPV. And so all we're doing is saying that when we take on a project with positive NPV, is that that just adds to the value of the firm. Well, looking at this from the, the bidding company's perspective, they have taken on a project that's going to increase the value of their firm by 50. So in order to find out this uh, new uh, merged value, all we have to do is take the standalone value of the acquirer and add that NPV. And that brings us up to 550. That brings us up to 550. Now, we have to be careful here, because um, if we looked at it uh, totally together, 
we said that delta V was equal to 100 and that if, uh, if we merge these things with stop, which we'll get to in a second, it would actually be worth 700. Why? Because we had standalone value of A being 500. We had standalone value of B being 100 plus 100 in incremental value. That would be 700. Why is this 550 instead of 700? What happened? Yeah, that cash left the firm, right? And so, as you mentioned earlier, when we buy, when we pay cash, what happens to those shareholders, those target shareholders? They dissolve. Yeah, they're gone, right? They're not our problem anymore. But guess what? They left with 150 in cash. And so, you can add all this stuff together and come up with 700, but then you've got to realize that 150 in cash left to acquire the target. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we can figure out what is the new price per share of the acquiring firm? Remember, we had 25 shares outstanding. And how do I find the price per share? I take that new merged value and divide by the number of shares outstanding. Did we issue any new shares to do this deal? No. And so we had 25 before, and we've got 25 now. And so 550 divided by that 25 gives us $22 per share. $22 per share is going to be the price after the merger. And uh, that is a gain of $2 per share over what it was before. Because remember, it was $20 before, now it's $22. If you truly get, and if we truly did this out in the real world and we saw the stock price go from $20 to $22, we would know that our estimate of delta V was correct. What if it didn't go up as high as we thought? Then our estimate of delta V was too high. And what if it goes up more than we thought? Then our estimate of delta V was too low. How often do you think the estimates of delta V are too low versus too high? Very rarely would I assume that, because you're, you're basing this on hubris and lack of information. Uh, too high is probably your common uh, outcome there. Okay, any questions so far? The cash acquisition is the easiest one to do as long as you remember that the cash leaves the firm. Questions? Okay, now let's talk about a stock acquisition. So in uh, the one we just talked about, the target shareholders received uh, cash and then they're gone. We don't have to deal with them anymore. But if you do a stock merger, then the target shareholders become shareholders in the new firm. Now let's think about that for a minute. If I own uh, a bunch of the shares in this firm and then we buy Mr. Pulowski's firm, now if we do it with cash, I still have an entire control of the firm. But there's a chance if we do this with stock, now he's going to have some votes and he's going to have some say in what happens going forward. And so if you are doing these uh, deals, you would prefer to use cash because you would prefer to retain control of the firm. So that's one of the reasons we're going to talk about that people would rather do cash than stock. Okay, now in a stock merger, so no cash changes hands, the value of the merged firm is the sum of the two standalone values plus the incremental gain. And so we had that formula down there on the bottom. I've already kind of mentioned it here. So that means this value of the merge firm is going to be 700. Now I want to point something out to you. When you get to the um, practice and exam practice calculations and homework, a lot of times it will say the value of the merged firm in an all-stop deal would be. What are you supposed to take from that? That means that it's the standalone value of A plus the standalone value of B plus delta V. That's what that means. And so once again, if I say where V sub AB is the value of the merged firm in an all-stock deal. That's what this means, this is the bottom equation here. There's no cash leaving the firm. 
Okay, now, here's the question. Now that we're using shares to pay for this instead of cash, how many shares did we have to issue? Well, the shares are worth $20 per share, <coughs> and we're going to have to pay $150 for this target. So 150 divided by 20 says we're going to have to issue seven and a half shares. Now, some people say, wait a minute, decimal shares are not possible. Wrong. I actually have decimal shares in my personal portfolio, so don't, don't let that freak you out. And besides, this is just a tiny, weird little example, right? Okay, so now we've got the original 25 shares plus seven and a half new shares. 25 plus seven and a half, it gives us 32 and a half shares outstanding. And so what's the new share price? Well, we're gonna take this new merged value of the firm, V sub AB, which is 700 here, and we're going to divide it by that 32.5 shares. And that's gonna give us $21.54 per share. It's gonna give us 21.54 per share. So what's the cost of acquiring B? Well, you might say, well, wait a minute, isn't it just 150? But it's not, and here's why. Because we gave up seven and a half shares. What are those shares worth now? $21.54. And so what we had to give up to acquire this is actually seven and a half times 21.54, which tells us that we had to spend $161 and 55 cents. And so we can still figure our NPV as 200 minus $161.55, and that gives us $38.45. What was the NPV when we did cash? 50, and what is it now? Less, right? Now, would we still accept this project? Yes. Is it as good for our shareholders as the first deal? No. If, there's, if everything else is equal, which one of these choo would you choose based on the goal of financial management? Cash. Yeah, cash, right? So we're gonna see there are lots of reasons to use cash, and so when we see people using shares, I want you to be suspicious, and we'll talk about why that is. Okay, now we can do our uh, check where we take 38.45 divided by the 25 original shares, by the way. We're talking about the original shares here when we uh, talk about this NPV. Remember that NPV is the gain to the acquiring firm. The NPV is the gain to the acquiring firm. And so how many shares is that spread out over? Not 32 and a half. It's spread out over the 25 original shares. And so now we see that 38.45 divided by the 25 original shares is a buck 54. If you take the original price and add a buck 54, you get $21.54. So the math all works out. What's the trickiest part of this? For students to recognize that when you use shares, you actually end up paying more than the official price, right? We were told here we're gonna be doing this for 150 and we converted that into a number of shares, but those shares after the merger are worth more. Okay, any questions? So far, just in your greedy little heart, which would you prefer to do, a cash or a share merger? Cash. Cash, right? And by the way, I feel the same way as a target shareholder, and we'll get to why that is. Okay, so why is the cost higher for stock versus a cash deal? And it turns out it, the bidding shareholders now have to share the gains, have to share the gains with those um, target shareholders. Remember in the first case, we totally got rid of the target shareholders. But now we're, having, we're all sitting in the same hot tub, we're having to share the gains with them. And so that's, that's why. So, what are the things that we need to consider when choosing cash or stock? Well, first of all, the sharing of gains, which we just talked about. Now, let's think about this. If a share offer forces the target to share the gains, what would happen if delta V was actually negative? What would a share offer do? It would force the target to share the 
losses. Do people like to share good things? Not really. That's not in our nature, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have to teach our kids to share. Does that make sense? How many of you, your parents says, share, 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 right? You remember that. I hated it, right? Because they were my toys, damn it. Okay, so why, why then would someone want to share the gains? Well, perhaps not because they're gains at all. Perhaps it's because they're losses. Does that make sense? And so if I know this thing is a turd, maybe what I want to do is offer shares so I can spread the misery, right? I'm not going to hurt myself as badly because you schmucks are going to take some of that loss on too. Now you ask yourself, why in the world would a CEO take on a project that they knew was negative delta V? Any ideas? Think back to chapter one. I know we talked about before that sometimes you want to buy something because you know it's going to fail either to beat that competition out or because you know that there's a future positive net profit value. Okay, so there's so there, there are possibly some arguments like that. But here's what I'm looking for. Why do CEOs typically buy things? Just thinking purely from a selfish, scumbag human being perspective. Because they know it's going to make them money? No. It's because, they, well, so yes, them personally, right? So let's think about this. Um, I gave you the, uh, the example of Eaton when we talked about chapter, in, in chapter one. I said they make all sorts of industrial parts and golf grips. Do you remember that? Why do you think they went out and made the golf grips acquisition? Yeah, they like to play golf. And now we can always hold our director meetings at great golf courses. Way to go, Jim, getting that golf grip sub to get the subsidiary. Phew! The board of directors meetings are so much better now. Does that make sense? Empire building is what we call it. Empire building. After all, uh, what do we know the CEO of a bigger firm is more valuable, more prestigious, right? And so we see that's the big reason we see people taking on these negative delta V projects that they know are negative delta V. Now, they may think they're positive delta V, that would be hubris. If they know they're negative delta V, we know they're doing it for their own benefit in some way, shape, or form. Does that make sense? If it were going to be profitable in the future, it wouldn't be a negative delta V situation because after all, the value of these things are the present value of all the expected future cash flows. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, there, that's number one. Uh, so be, be careful about uh, people wanting to buy your firm with shares. Another reason would be something we call adverse selection. Why would a, a bidding firm offer you shares even if they thought Delta V was positive? Well, how about this? What if their shares are overvalued? Think about this. Uh, our shares are currently selling at $25 per share. I only think they're worth 20. If I'm gonna go out there and make an acquisition, I would rather use my stock. Does that make sense? But what if the uh, firms, the, the shares, I think they're worth 20 but they're actually trading at 15. I would be crazy to offer up my stock, right? I'd be better off to go ahead and just pay cash because I would be uh, giving away underpriced shares. I would be getting, selling shares at a discount. And so here's what someone offering shares says, another thing it can say, and that is my shares are currently overvalued. My shares are currently overvalued. I'll give you a prime example. Roll back in time with me to 1998, close to about the time some of you were being born. And we had this big company called AOL. And AOL was the internet provider for most people. And, uh, and it was a dot-com boom, and so their shares were highly overvalued. And so, of course, we know that managers like the Empire Build. And so the CEO of AOL says, well, hey, we should go out and buy one of these old media companies. And so there's this company called Time Warner. 
and they had books and magazines and they also had cable television and all sorts of other stuff and so AOL went out and bought them with their inflated shares. Now how do I know they were inflated? Because what happened next lets you know that they were inflated because then you know once uh, someone realizes the emperor has no clothes all those internet stars start to deflate. The CEO knew when he made the offer that the shares were overvalued. So if someone offers you shares for your firm, it's not a good sign either way. Either they think this is a stinker deal and we're all gonna share the pain, or they think their shares are overvalued. If you do get the shares, what should you immediately do with them? <coughs> Sell them, right? Does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about taxes. Cash usually uh, ends up causing taxes, and the taxes are for the target shareholders. Let's say that one more time. The taxes are for the target shareholder, and here's why. If I bought these shares for $15 a share, and now you're offering me $20, I'm going to have a capital gain of $5 per share, and I will incur a capital gains tax. Does that make sense? Now, does it always result in that? Absolutely not. What if I paid 25 for the shares five years ago and now they're down to 15 and you offer me 20? I'm going to have a $5 capital loss. Is that going to incur positive taxes on my part? Absolutely not. And so that's why we say cash um, usually results in taxes. If the they're paying you more for your shares than you paid for them, then it will result in taxes for you. So that might be a reason for you to prefer shares, or yeah, prefer shares to cash. Because if you have a continuing equity position in the firm after the merger, then you are only seen as having traded one equity position for another. You are not having a capital gain out of that. And then finally, control. As we discussed earlier, additional shares can impact the control of the firm. By the way, do you think control is valuable? Yeah, control is valuable. Uh, if you've ever sat on the couch and someone else has the TV remote, and you're like, hey, hey, go back, hey, hey, can you see that control has value? And also, when you're out driving, my wife and I, I usually drive, sometimes she drives, and when she drives, how do you, what do you think my mental state is at that point? <laughs> I'm freaking out, man. Why? Because I don't have control. So control has benefit, and you've got to be careful using shares, because when you put more shares out there, it dilutes the position of the majority shareholders, and it leads to a greater probability of takeover. Does that make sense? Okay. And we talked about the, the signaling, the adverse selection. If I offer shares, it signals my shares are overvalued. If I offer cash, on the other hand, what might that signal? You're doing okay. Not only that, my shares are undervalued, right? I'm not going to give up shares. My shares are undervalued. I'd rather use cash. Plus, it also does send that signal that's like, hey, I've got enough cash to make this work. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's get back to where we were. I think, were we at the end of this slide? I think we stopped at mergers, advantages and disadvantages. Oh, yes, yes, because we just talked about what scumbag target managers are. Why are the target managers likely to resist a takeover? They're going to lose their jobs, right? And what about the target board members? They're most likely going to lose their jobs. And so these people, of course, are going to resist. Are they acting in the interest of, of their own shareholders when they do that? Absolutely not. Right? Because we got the standalone value, you're going to have to offer a premium on top of that. This is the most the shares have ever been worth, right? So it doesn't make sense for them to resist other than to perhaps push up the price to try to get a better offer. Does that make sense?
Okay, now let's talk about the acquisition of stock. Let's assume that we can't just get these people to go along with this and, and, and vote and we're going to have a big old happy family. So how do I then manage to get those votes? Well, I can just go out there and buy the stock. Does that make sense? I can go out there and buy the stock. And so I'm going to go out there and, and the way this works is I don't immediately announce to the world that I'm trying to buy this firm. Under the securities laws of the United States, you only have to announce your uh, position after you have crossed 5%. So I'm going to go out there. Here's what I'm going to do. If I'm the uh, bidder, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start buying up the share a little bit at a time, right? I'm not going to go out there and make a big splash and buy up 4.999% of this on one day. I'm going to do it. Uh, over a period of weeks perhaps. And not only that, I might have set up some subsidiary shell companies where I'm, so it doesn't look like one individual or group is buying up these shares. The SEC requires me though, at the end of the day on which my ownership passes 5%, then I have to report those holdings and I have to report my intentions for what I'm trying to do. Now, it could just be that I really like the stock and I wanted to have a big stake in it. And you often hear that. People say, no, we're just, we just want to be a beneficial owner, meaning that they just get money for having done this. But you could also, you might also have to announce that, hey, I'm, uh, I'm trying to acquire this firm. I'm, I want to merge this firm with mine. So you have to announce your intentions. Now, this leads to the following strategy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build up my sh uh, stake in the target firm little by little until we get to 4.999999% and then on the last day I'm going to go all out and I'm going to buy as many shares as I possibly can because at the end of that day what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to announce to the world what I'm trying to do with this firm. And what do you think is going to happen to the share price of the target once people figure out what I'm trying to do? Remember, I'm having to offer a premium. And they don't know what the premium is yet, so what are they going to do? They're going to jump in there and they're going to buy these shares and drive up the price. Why are they buying the shares? Well, it's currently 20. And yeah. And so it's, they're, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, if I buy this at 22 and he offers 25, I can still make three bucks. And when all that buying happens, what does it do? When a bunch of people want to buy the same stock at the same time, what happens to the price? It goes up, right? Okay, so that's why I want to keep this so quiet for as long as I possibly can, because otherwise that share price is going to go up and that's going to raise my cost to acquire the target. Okay, so what do I do? I get it up there, I make my um, and I make my filing with the government, which then immediately gets spread all over the world. Wall Street Journal picks up on it. And then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a tender offer. What is a tender offer? That's where I offer you something in exchange for your shares. And that something is going to be cash or securities or a mix of the both. Now, the tender offer is frequently contingent on the bidder getting a certain percentage of the shares. Remember, we said that a merger usually requires greater than or equal to two-thirds of the shareholders, sometimes greater than or equal to three-quarters of the shareholders or shares to vote in favor of that. And so I've got to get at least that amount. But more frequently, you'll see people make it contingent upon getting 80% of the target shares. And the reason is going back to something we talked about in Chapter 6, and that is dividend taxation. If a corporation owns at least 80% of the shares of another corporation, then the dividends they receive from that corporation are tax-free. Let me say that one more time. If a company owns at least 80% of another company, then the dividends they receive from that company are tax-free. 79.9%? No. 80%? Yes. And so when I make a tender offer, typically what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, folks, uh, I'm, I'm saying I'm going to offer you this, but the deal's off if I don't get at least 80% of the shares. So.
So let's see how a tender offer would typically work. Um, you guys are the investing public. Actually, you're the you're the target shareholders, and I am the bidder. And I'm going to at the current share price is 20. I'm going to reach out to you guys and offer you 25. How many of you would sell your $20 shell shares for $25 a piece? Just raise your hand. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Have I gotten to 80% yet? No. How could I get the rest of these people on board? Offer a deal. Yeah, offer more money, right? I say, okay, that $25 shares is withdrawn. Now I'm offering 27. Raise your hand if you would take 27. By the way, if you take 25, your hand should be up now, right? Yeah. And so then, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this, pro this process until I get at least 80%. Now, here's the downside. Uh, a lot of people, they fail to think about what does this mean for NPV. Because at some point, if I pay too much for the target, it's going to rise above VB star, and this is going to be a negative NPV project. And how do people get pulled into that? Have you ever been to an auction? Anybody here? Yeah. So have you seen this situation where there's this piece of crap, and the auctioneer's saying, do I hear 15? And someone says, and then he says, do I hear 20? And someone else raises their hand. And these people's eyes meet across the room. What are they now? They're competitors, right? And they will bid this thing up to well over its intrinsic value. Why? Yes, it's oh, I won, right? And to me, the person that wins in that situation is the one who loses the auction because they're not going home with a piece of crap they paid too much for. Do you think that managers might think the same way as the bidders in an auction? Absolutely. I want to win. By the way, do you think uh, the people who wind up being CEOs of a company are typically people who like to win? Oh, hell yeah. I wouldn't want to play pool at their house at all, right? Because they would always be like, Ugh. you know, if they didn't win, they would be really crappy. So the point here is they, they want to win and force these target shareholders to sell. But they could go so high that they end up making it a negative NPV project. As a result, here's what you need to do if you ever find yourself in the position of being a bidding manager. You need to have a number in your head. And that number is the last one that makes this a positive NPV deal. And uh, when the people say, when you, when you get to that number and you still don't have 80%, what do you do? Yeah, you walk away, right? You walk away. And in fact, when you put it out there, you say, this is my final offer. Now, do people say that and then not mean it? Yeah, so you, you can't truly signal that it's your final offer you do tell people. And when they don't take it, you say, fine. Example, Microsoft was bidding for Yahoo. They threw in a bid. They didn't get what they wanted. They, th they raised a bid. They raised a bid. By the way, Microsoft was sitting on a boatload of money at the time. And eventually, they got to the point they were like, you know what? Forget you. Forget you. I don't need your damn company. And by the way, it was a good call. Where's Yahoo today? In the toilet, right? Does that make sense? OK. So. Now, listen, the, the next thing is, um, as a bidding manager, do I even know who you people are if you're the target shareholders? Can I just walk down the street and say, oh, wait a minute, she owns shares in Starbucks. Can, do I have that magical power? No, I don't. Nobody does. And so how am I going to figure out who to address this tender offer to? Well, I need a list of the shareholders. Who, by the way, has a list of the shareholders? the target managers, right? And so I'm going to get a hold of the target managers and say, hey, uh, we're going to offer your shareholders a lot of money. Uh, would you mind sharing that mailing list? What are they going to tell us? It's going to something like this, right? They're not going to do that because after all, they are not wanting you to take over their firm. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you make a public a, a press release, right? And you hope that the shareholders are reading the Wall Street Journal. 
Secondly, you go to the brokerage houses. At brokerage houses, do you think they know who owns what shares? Absolutely. And do you think the brokerage house would be pleased for you to sell your shares to this bidding company? Yeah, why? Commission. Yeah, they're gonna get commissions, right? Or at least in the world before uh, our current situation where there's commission-free trading, still not sure how that works, uh, but they, they would get a commission, right? And so you end up with the brokers being willing to help you out here by, by, and now they won't give you the names of the shareholders, but what will they do? They'll pass the offer along. They'll pass the offer along. How many of you, when you get an email from your broker, <coughs> just ignore it? How many of you have brokerage accounts? Do you ever ignore emails from your broker? No, why not? Usually it's about money. Usually it's about money. And what gets our attention? Money, food, sex, right? If you get emails about any of these things, by the way, if someone sends any emails about sex, it's probably spam, right? <laughs> but if it's money or food, of course you're going to check it. Questions? Could you go to the SEC and ask for that information? The SEC doesn't know. Yeah, or I should say, I don't believe the SEC actually knows. Really? They can, form. what's that? It requires that they have to write a form, some advice, some like stock, document stock, they have to write a form with the SEC and the SEC publish them, no? Right, so remember earlier when I said about getting up to 5%? Mm -hmm. those, those are the people who have to report their holdings, yeah. right? Now, I will tell you this though, the SEC is also able to track trading patterns. And so they can track, so it's a possibility that they would know. But are, are they going to be in the uh, mark, are they going to be in the business of providing that information to? They have, I mean, the, those 5% people have to. Like yes, that. but the others don't, right? By the way, the majority of people it, it, it don't. Really yeah, so the majority of people, do you think they own at least 5% of the firm? No. I own one one billionth of General Electric. How much? One one billionth. There are, a billion, oh, there are 10 billion shares outstanding. I own 10 of them, right? Most people, and that's why we say that shareholding for corporations is atomistic, meaning that the, the shareholdings of all these, there's like a countless number of shareholders, mm -hmm. but they've all got tiny, tiny holdings. There are only a few that are 5% of the firm. Okay, don't go to the SEC asking for this information. They're not going to have it. So as you said, before usually a tender offer, there's before an offer is made to the company, there's a public announcement made saying that they want to buy the company. Okay, so uh, here's let's walk through the whole process. I have been admiring um, Ms. Minahan's company for quite some time. And here's what I do as a CEO of the bidding company. I send her a letter. I say, Ms. Minahan, we've been admiring your company for quite some time. You've done such a fabulous job. Can you tell I'm buttering her up? Done such a fabulous job. We think that our two com com companies can be even greater together. I would love to, uh, I mean, and we would be willing to offer $5 more per share than your current share price. Now, as soon as Ms. Minahan gets that letter, what does she do? Turn away. Yep. She's like, <gasps> that's the first thing she does, right? <gasps> and then she shreds it. And then I wait a couple of weeks. I don't hear from Ms. Minahan. And so what do I do then? I send a letter to her board of directors. And I say, Dear Board of Erect Directors, uh, recently I reached out to your CEO to express my admiration for your company and to offer a premium of $5 per share for your firm. Now, what do the directors all do? <gasps> and Well, they, they might. Yeah, they do. They do. But they're, they're going to have a, a little confab, and what are, all gonna, what are they all going to say? No. And then once uh, that, that two weeks is over, then I start down this path of what we're talking about here. So at this point, point only like 13 people know that I'm trying to buy the firm. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about what Ms. Minahan does after I make my 
tender offer. Ms. Minahan says, Dr. Haggard's offer for our firm vastly undervalues the firm. Now, the firm is currently worth $20 a share. I'm offering $25. What do we know about Ms. Minahan? She's absolutely full of crap, right? Because she said I vastly under or overvalued or undervalued the firm. If I was truly vastly undervaluing the firm, what should the share price be? Something higher than 25. It shouldn't be 20. Does that make sense? And then they say that we think we can do better to grow shareholder wealth as a standalone entity. Now, why is she saying all these things? I'm sorry to pick on you, Ms. Manahan. Why are you saying all these things? Why are you saying all these lies? <laughs> because I don't want you to buy it. Yeah, and why don't you, why don't you want me to buy it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because what's going to happen when we come in there? By the way, why is Ms. Minahan's stock really down to $20 a share where I could buy it? She's a lousy CEO, right? She's been doing a bad job. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, she's been doing a bad job. And so uh, she knows that if I take over, she's going to lose her job. Does that make sense? Okay, there are a few times. Go ahead. Um. So there's another reason that a company which at 4.9% um, makes a huge jump because of the poison pill? Okay, we'll get to poison pills. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, what we want to do is keep things under the radar as long as possible to avoid stirring up. By the way, if the company suddenly adopts a poison pill, and I've seen this, a company will suddenly adopt a poison pill which we'll talk about what that is, but it's a defense mechanism. And it's out of freaking nowhere. Now, what does that mean? It means, let's, let's assume it's Ms. Minahan's company. It means that Ms. Minahan has received the offer and has told me, right? Or probably just hasn't responded. It means that the board of directors has also received it and they said, and then they're like, what are we gonna do? And the answer is always, we've gotta protect our phony baloney jobs, right? And so they're, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, how are we going to do that? How are we going to keep this ass haggard from buying our company? Well, hey, let's take these defensive measures. Now, so far, the only people that know about this deal are me, Ms. Minahan, and her board. And so when you see a board adopt one of these defensive measures just out of the blue, it lets you know someone has made an offer, and that offer is not yet public. Does that help? Okay. Now... I will say this, on occasion, uh, people will buy a company in order to get their CEO. So uh, JP Morgan Chase bought Bank One of Ohio in order to get Jamie Dimon, because he was a rising star in banking. That's been when I was in MBA school. And he's still in charge. He's still in charge at JP Morgan. It was a good call for them. He's created a lot of shareholder value. Another example actually comes from my own career. I was working for Halliburton. My CEO at the time was Dick Cheney. Do you guys know who Dick Cheney is? Former vice president. This was before he was vice president. He was CEO of Halliburton. And Dick Cheney was out on a quail hunt with the CEO of Dresser Industries. And you're smiling because you know what happens on quail hunts with Dick Cheney. You get shot in the face. It happens. Anyway, so but Dick Cheney is out there on the quail hunt and he says to, and the guy's name was Bill Bradford, He's like, hey, Bill, we've been admiring your company for quite some time. What's the first thing Bill thinks? Yeah, Cheney's got a gun, right? Okay, so, and, and Bill's like, mm, thank you. And then Dick says, you know, what would be really great is if we could put our two great companies together. Now, what does Bill start doing? I'm getting scared. Yeah, he's getting scared, and he's like, no, Dick, you know, like you as a friend, don't like you that way, right? And then Dick says, Bill, the real reason I want to do this deal is I'm going to be running for vice president, and we need someone like you to run the new Halliburton. What just happened to you, Bill? Do you feel better or worse? I'm better. Oh, yeah. You're like, hey, Dick, let's talk. And by, by the way, 
I don't think the quail are out today. Let's just go back to the hunting lodge and start working on this right now. Occasionally that happens. How often is that? Rarely. Rare. And what happens is you have to look at the, the target. If the target has been increasing in value and the CEO is doing a great job, the chance that they're buying the company to get the CEO is greater. What if the shareholder, shares of the target have been doing this? No, that, they're going to get rid of that CEO. Does that make sense? And if they don't, they're stupid. Oh, man. Okay. Now, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the acquisition of stock. First of all, no shareholder meeting has to be uh, held. If I buy, if I've got 80% of the shares, I can hold the shareholder meeting in the men's restroom at the Newark International Airport. And here's why. Who's the only one that matters? You. Me, right? So we don't have to have a shareholder meeting. And it bypasses the target management and board to appeal directly to the target shareholders. By the way, are the target shareholders, oh, I hate to say this because sometimes they are, but are they stupid? They, do, they, do they like money? Let me put it that way. Do they like money? Yeah. Would they like to know that someone's making a premium offer for their shares? Yeah. Now, occasionally, you'll find people who fall victim to uh, this, what the managers say, and they believe that crap. Um, and I'll give you an example when we get around to talking about defensive measures where the, the shareholders actually did believe, believe the target management. Okay, now what are the disadvantages? I love this. Can be unfriendly. This is what the book says, can be unfriendly. Folks, we call it a hostile takeover. This is a hostile takeover. If you've ever heard of a hostile takeover, this is what they're talking about where you're bypassing the board and the management to go straight to the shareholders, that's pretty unfriendly, that's a hostile takeover. And it can take the cost higher because as the target management says no, 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 what do I have to do to try to get people on board? I have to increase the amount. At the very least, the, some of the shareholders are gonna believe these target managers and demand more money for their shares. So it's going to take that cost higher than if we just did a straight up merger. And then a significant minority of the target shareholders might hold out. Earlier, remember when I told you I'm going to make this $25 offer and a lot of you jumped in immediately? Those of you who didn't take the offer, assuming you were listening, what was on your mind? What were you thinking? Yeah, I'm going to hold on to it in, in hopes of what? Yeah, yeah higher offer. Do you have a question? Yeah, so instead of this idea of like offering the shareholders a premium to get them to sell it, couldn't you reverse it, like tank a company's stock, then go get it? How do you do that? Uh, buy up all their debt or make it to where they can't perform anymore, probably. Okay. Um, are you familiar with something called the law? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I was like, because I've heard of the idea of like corporate raiders before. Okay, so corporate raiders are actually uh, people engaged in hostile takeovers. And uh, back in, and you're using the term from the 80s, and back in the 80s, the media painted these corporate raiders as these vicious, bloodthirsty pirates that were just going around ruining everyone's lives. In truth, the vicious, bloodthirsty people were the target managers that were mismanaging the firms for their own benefit. If you ever want to watch a really good movie, now there's, there's some nudity, some foul language, um, but I still recommend it anyway. It's called Barbarians at the Gate. And it's all about uh, this corporate rating. And, and, and the, the mechanisms are the same today, but you don't hear people use that term nearly as much. But let me put it this way. If you've got a well-run run firm and the share price is, is getting really high because it's well-run, uh, what are your chances of becoming a target? Pretty low. And so these corporate raiders, who are they going after? Yeah, people, firms that have a good basic business but have been poorly managed. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Um, lots of times, you know, we see companies say they're doing a merger, but they really just run the company to the ground and 
just have it for their own sake. Are there any laws or regulations that define the difference between an acquisition and a merger? That's to a prevent companies from doing that? Oh, okay, so tell me, you're, you're putting forward the idea that people would buy something just to run it into the ground. So, like a competitor, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, apparently we don't have any laws that keep that from happening because it does happen, right? And I'll give you an example. Apple goes out and buys up stuff and then they take the good ideas out of it and then they just let it die, right? Yeah. So apparently that's not illegal. Where would that get blocked? It would get blocked for anti-competitive reasons. So let's assume that Apple is doing uh, you know, this thing, right? And there's another company that's doing something related and Apple goes out to buy that. The government could block that acquisition on the basis of it being anti-competitive. How often does that happen with Apple? Almost never, and here's why. Apple is this big and the people they buy are like this big. And so is it really gonna uh, impact competition much one way or the other? No. So the government stays out of the way. So Apple comes in and does its thing, and then it spits out the husk, right? It gets what it wants, and so no, it's not illegal. And by the way, if I'm one of the shareholders in the target firm, and Apple buys us out at a premium, do I give a damn? I'm thrilled, right? I'm taking my premium, and I'm gonna go invest it in something else. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, uh, let's see. So, got to be careful with these minority target shareholders holding out. Uh, if I don't get 80%, then I've got to start paying taxes on those dividends. And then finally, complete absorption requires a merger. You, you can't just do the acquisition of stock. After you do the acquisition of stock, now you have the votes to go back and do what we talked about first, and that is a legal merger. Whew. Okay, any questions about acquisition of stock? By the way, I will tell you this, my, my, uh, my dad, my dad, he's 82 years old, and he has these different stocks, and he, got, he gets so upset when someone acquires one of the companies that he holds. And I said, Dad, why are you getting upset? They offer you more than the shares are worth. He said, yeah, but I have to pay taxes on them. I'm like, well, you know, I like making enough money that I have to pay taxes. Isn't that great? What I didn't recognize was that my dad was hoping to exercise the death option. Have you guys heard of the death option? So here's the deal. Go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, no, he's, he's not that sophisticated. So here's the trick. He's got these stocks that he's going to pass on to my sister and me when he dies. And when he dies, uh, they, they basically uh, take a snapshot of what all the stock prices are on the day he dies. And that becomes the new cost basis for it in my portfolio. So if my dad paid $40 a share, and these things are up to $100 at the time he dies, there's $60 of capital gain that goes untaxed, right? Nothing that my dad hates worse than paying taxes that he might not have to. So it makes him so mad when someone buys him out because two things. Number one, he's got to pay that tax. And number two, he's got to go out and figure out someplace else to put that money. And I think I've told you about his portfolio before. It's like a dozen stocks. When one of your dozen stocks, you know, you're already pretty undiversified, you need to go out and find a new stock to put those things in, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the, that's the only time I could think of someone being upset that someone was offering a premium for their shares. Now, what happens if I can't get you guys to go along, if I can't get 80%? What if I could only get 50 plus something percent? Well, then I might make an offer to acquire the assets of the firm. So instead of First of all, trying to convince the shareholders to vote for a merger. Uh, failing that, trying to acquire the stock. Failing that, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to say, look, I'd like to buy the assets of the firm, which would include the corporate headquarters, all the uh, uh, intellectual cap property, 
uh, the factories, the machines, all that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you an offer for that. And that kind of offer only requires 50 plus 1, 50 percent plus 1 of the shareholders. So I don't have to get a supermajority for that. I only have to get 50 percent plus 1. So that's the advantage is I don't have to worry about a minority of shareholders holding out. A simple majority can approve the sales. However, the downsides. Uh, it requires, you remember we talked about the uh, merger being simple because you didn't have to retitle any assets? Well, when you do an acquisition of assets, you have to retitle each and every single one of those things. Now, if it's a company that only has one asset, not a big deal. But what if it's a car rental company? Oh man, do you want to really sit down there at the DMV for all? No! Right? And so you'd much rather try to acquire the stock of the rental car company. Now I'm going to go throw one more advantage out here that they don't mention in the book. And that is when you just buy the assets, do you get the employees? No, you don't get the employees. By the way, do you think we're going to keep all the employees at the target firm? Absolutely not. If we do, there's something wrong, right? We're not taking advantage of economies of scale. And anytime you hear someone say, oh yeah, we're going to have a merger, but there aren't going to be any layoffs, let me tell you with certainty that that person is full of shit. They are lying to you and they know it. They are lying to you and they know it. Uh, that happened when I went through this thing with Halliburton. They're like, oh no, everybody's going to keep their job. I get sent down to the, the Target's plant to try to get them on the Halliburton system of things. About 30 days in, this guy shows up and he's like, okay, federal law requires us to tell you 60 days in advance that we're going to shut your plant down. And suddenly I went from being the guy that's helping them get onto the Halliburton system to being uh, the Grim Reaper, right? Because I was the only Halliburton guy on site. And so uh, anytime someone, t and by the way, uh, that's when on my 28th birthday I laid off 79 people. Just sent a packet, right? And some of them were better than people that I had working for me at the other facility. Did we want to have to deal with those employees? Well, it would have been easier for me if they had just bought the assets, right? Because then I wouldn't have had to have laid off 79 people on my 28th birthday. Does that make sense? Okay, now, if I buy the assets, here, let's just use the rental car agency again. If we do this situation where uh, I'm Avis and I'm going to buy Hertz. Avis and Hertz are still around, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm Avis, I'm going to buy Hertz. And I manage to just buy the assets of Hertz. Here's what I'm going to do. By the way, Avis and Hertz at the airport, usually they're either facing each other or they're right next to each other. Have you guys noticed that? They're, they're all within, I can see you kind of range. Can I go to the Avis people at the airport and ask them about the employees at Hertz? Which ones are worth a damn? Yeah, don't get that Eric guy. He always shows up hungover and he's usually late and he always reeks of whatever, weed, let's say. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to use the employees at the current desk, the Avis desk, to tell me which of the Hertz ones are useful, good people. By the way, three people at Avis, three people at the Hertz desk. How many people do you think are going to have to be at the combined desk? Do you think we're going to need six? No, we're probably going to need four or five, right? And so that means that I can make offers to some of the Hertz people and not to all of them. In fact, when I was uh, laying the 79 people off, I had the HR guy next to me. And he had a list of people that we actually wanted to keep. We couldn't keep them, though, because they were members of a union. We were non-union. If we kept them, we kept the union. So we had to basically clean house, which was unfortunate because they were good people. Anyway, what would happen, we had this list of people we wanted to keep. And as I'm handing out the paychecks, uh, I'm saying, thank you for your service. Have a nice life. Thank you for your service. Have, have a nice life. If one of them came up, that was on our list, he would go whoop. And I would say, thank you so much for your service. We would actually like for you to put in an application at our Beltline Road facility in Carrollton. 
I am telling you this would be a great idea for you to go ahead and put that application in. And they'd say, yeah, and they move on. And then the next one, I'd pick, I'd pull up their final check. HR guy looks at it. If they're not on the list, have a nice life, right? Does that make sense? And so you do something similar with these acquisition of assets. You figure out who the decent people are. You make them an offer to keep them. Does that make sense? Who's responsible then for getting rid of the other employees? By the way, the target firm still exists. All we did was buy the assets. What's left is called a shell company. And that shell company is responsible for dispositioning those employees. Heck, they can keep them all if they want. I don't care, right? Okay, now let's talk one more thing about shell companies. They don't have any assets except for a big old pile of cash and they've got their ticker for the stock market. Do you think that ticker has value? Yeah, IPOs are expensive. And so what this, uh, this shell company can do is sell or uh, pay out that money they receive for the assets as a liquidating dividend. And then they can engage in a reverse merger where basically a company that wants to go public can merge with them and then use their stock ticker to be on the public markets. And this was a very popular way for Chinese firms <coughs> to go public on American markets until the SEC figured out what they were doing. Why do you think the Chinese firms wanted to go this way instead of going through the whole IPO process, other than the cheapness? They were keeping it in name. Say again? They were keeping it in name. Okay, they were keeping a name. That's important. Regulations. Regulations. If you're going to do an IPO, I'm going to force you to disclose lots of information and provide audited financial statements from a credible auditor. Do you think these Chinese firms necessarily had that? No. Do you think it's possible that some of these Chinese firms were total shams? Yeah. There was one, it was a forestry company, and they claimed to own more acres of trees than existed in all of China. Is that possible? No. And so that's why the, some of these shadier Chinese companies were choosing to do these reverse mergers. Now, was it good for the shareholders of the shell company? Absolutely. They would get a little more money before the company just basically went away. But... Was it good for uh, the market in general? No, because now we've got these shady companies out there who have managed to get on the public markets without the proper amount of scrutiny. Questions? Yes, they changed the law. That happened for a long time, but then they got wise to it, and uh, that's no longer a path for these Chinese companies. Other questions? Okay, see you next time.